I had just finished observing a major installation in Spokane and was heading east on Highway 90 to see an old friend, Joe Neely, who lived on the shores of Lake Coeur d'Alene in northern Idaho. This was not my first trip to the Pacific Northwest, but it was the first time I had been to this part of Idaho. Joe and I served together many years ago in Cherry Point, North Carolina. I met his wife and the first of his three children and had dinner at his house many times. When he left, we promised to keep in touch, and over the years, we sent each other frequent cards and letters. I hadn't heard from him for several months, so when I told him I would be in Spokane, he invited me to visit. I followed his directions and eventually ended up in front of his log house, built on a wooded bluff overlooking Lake Coeur d'Alene. As I pulled up, he stepped out of the house and we exchanged hearty handshakes and manly hugs. He looked a little older than I remembered, but he was as strong as ever. What's up, old salt? He asked. Fine, I answered him. And you? I could complain, but that wouldn't do any good, he replied, laughing. Come on out, I've got elk steaks on the grill and beer in the ice box. I could smell the barbecue, and the invitation to taste the elk steaks made my mouth water. Where's your lovely wife, I asked as he handed me a cold beer. She passed away a few months ago or so, he replied sadly. She was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, but by the time they discovered it, it was too late. I'm sorry to hear that, I said. I thought the world of Wendy. Thank you, he said. She was a damn good woman, the best. Are you guys dating again or what? I asked. He shook his head. No, he said. She made me promise to find someone after she died, but honestly, I just couldn't do it. When you're married to the best, everything else pales in comparison. He served the elk steaks and we started eating. I'd never eaten elk before, so this was a real treat. How are you holding up? I asked. Fine, he replied. At least I get to enjoy the view every day, he added, looking out at the lake. Wendy and I fell in love with this place the first time we saw it and decided to stay. The kids come here a couple times a year, and I get to spoil the grandkids. He looked at me for a minute before continuing. You know, Wendy wasn't my first wife, he said. No, I didn't know that, I told him. I, I never told you about my first wife, but if she hadn't cheated on me, I never would have met Wendy, he said. I don't know if I told you, but I read your stories on the website. Enjoyed the hell out of them. Thanks, I told him. It's just a hobby of mine while I'm on the road, just for fun. You really stirred up a hornet's nest with a couple of them, he said, smiling. Screw the critics, that's what I say. Keep writing. I appreciate it, I told him. You might want to write a story about what happened to me and my first wife, he said. I'll definitely listen to it, I told him, pulling out the audio recorder. Would you mind if I recorded it? I want to make sure I get it right. Go ahead, he said. He started telling his story after I put the recorder on the table between us. Joe's story. I enlisted in the Marines right out of high school in 1974. It was either that or spend the rest of my life working at my father's hardware store. After boot camp, I ended up at MCS El Toro Base in California. That's where I first met Marcy. She was a year younger than me, and we hit it off great. We dated for a few months before I proposed. She said yes, and her father, a career Marine who had done three tours in Vietnam, approved the proposal. We got married in a small church ceremony and went to Vegas for our honeymoon. I thought I had it all worked out. Marcy was a beautiful girl with just the right curves in all the right places. She had long, curly, blonde hair that went down to her shoulders, and she was a real savage in bed. She was also a bit of an exhibitionist. I'll never forget one night when we were in the pool at the apartment complex where we lived in Anaheim. There was no one around, so she took off her bikini and threw it on the side of the pool. I wasn't stupid. I took off my swim trunks and headed to the edge of the pool where she was standing, her breasts just above the water. When we were done and out of the pool, I wrapped a towel around me and picked up my swim trunks. But not Marcy. She just took the towel and bikini and walked completely naked to our apartment, which was on the second floor in another part of the complex. 
Hell, anyone could see her if they were looking. When we got into the apartment, she spread herself out on the bed. Then we rolled around some more and finally fell asleep early in the morning. That's how we had it. And I considered myself the luckiest man in the world. About six months after we were married, I received orders to go to Okinawa on a one-year unaccompanied tour of duty. There were many tears, but we managed to work things out. Since she was taking night classes to get her nursing certificate and working herself, we decided to keep the apartment. I was getting money out of my paycheck to pay the rent, so she only had to worry about utilities, which wasn't much. She had her own car and hated driving my truck, so that wasn't a problem. We made love the night before I left and promised to be faithful to each other and write every day. I hated leaving like that, but I had no choice. For the first ten months or so, we wrote every day. Hot, passionate letters. I loved getting her letters because she always smeared them with perfume, and I always got turned on reading what she wanted to do to me. About six weeks before I left Okinawa, she told me that her high school friend Bridget was going to San Francisco for a couple of weeks during the vacations and asked if she could go. I decided it couldn't hurt and agreed, but on the condition that she keep writing and letting me know how she was doing and where she was. She agreed and kept her promise for a while, but then the letters stopped coming. I continued to write but received nothing in reply. About a week before the rotation, I went to the USO and called the apartment, but got no answer. That's when I called her friend to find out what was wrong. Bridget was getting ready to head back east to see her boyfriend and told me that Marcy had decided to stay in San Francisco a while longer to visit some friends from her high school. She didn't know who they were and didn't have any contact info. Hell, I didn't even know she had friends there. Then the letters I sent her in San Francisco started coming back unopened and marked, address unknown. What the hell? I puzzled. Where the hell was she? I started to get scared, thinking maybe she'd been kidnapped or worse. I called Marcy's parents, who were in San Diego at the time, to see if they knew where she was, but they said they hadn't heard from her in weeks. Let's not forget that in those days we didn't have cell phones, internet, or anything like that. They offered to pick me up from March Air Force Base when I got back if I hadn't heard from Marcy. Upon reflection, I realized that there could be many reasons for this. Maybe she was on a bus headed for Orange County. So I decided to wait until I got home and hoped she would be there. The day before I left, I called home again, but no one picked up the phone. So I called her parents and told them. They weren't too happy with Marcy, but agreed to pick me up and take me to the apartment. True to their word, they met me at Marche and drove me back to the apartment. When we got there, it was already dark, and I couldn't see any light from the windows of the apartment. Her father helped me carry my things to the apartment. I opened the door and went inside, hoping to find Marcy. Instead, I found a dusty apartment with no life in it. Everything had been cleaned. Marcy was a fastidious hostess but there was a thin layer of dust on everything, as if no one had been here in a long time. Her father and I looked around, hoping to find clues, but there was nothing to indicate that she had been here for any length of time. Most of her clothes were gone, as was almost all of her jewelry. Her father noticed a pawn ticket on the dresser and handed it to me. I had no idea what she might have pawned, but decided to call the store first thing. Let me know if you hear anything, her father said, getting ready to leave. If there's anything we can do, call. I thanked him and put my gear away. I looked around but couldn't find anything that indicated where she might be. I went down to the garage and found that my truck was still there. Marcy usually parked her car in a designated spot under the carport, and it was still there. Where the hell is she? I wondered. I called the local police to file a missing persons report but was turned down. To hell with it, I thought and went to bed. The next day, I got my first leads. I called the pawn shop at the number on the ticket her father had found and learned that she had sold her wedding and engagement rings for $100. I was outraged. I had been saving up for those rings for months and paying money for them. The store offered to sell them back to me, but I refused. In a rage, I took the ring off and hit it with a hammer. Later, while cleaning and packing, I came across a stack of letters addressed to Marcy 
from one John from San Francisco. The letters were written six months before she told me about her trip. I couldn't believe she would leave me like that, but I had to find out what was in those letters, so I started reading them. As you can imagine, they were no less ardent than the letters Marcy and I had written to each other, but I learned something else. As I read the letters, I realized that Marcy and John had known each other since high school and had been seeing each other the entire time we'd been married, meeting before school or in the evenings when I stayed late on base. I hope your dumbass husband enjoyed sleeping with you after me, one of the letters said. I thought I was going to throw up when I read that, but there was more. Maybe I could get you pregnant and your husband could raise the baby. Wouldn't that be great? Another letter said. That wasn't all, and each letter made me even angrier than the last. It finally became clear that Marcy and John were planning for her to stay with him in San Francisco. The trip with Bridget was just a cover as they tried to make it look like she had just disappeared. It also became clear to me that she had graduated and was going to get a job as a nurse in San Francisco. Of course, she didn't tell me she had finished her education, but that was part of their plan. Anger couldn't even describe how I felt. How could she do this to me? To us, I wondered. I had many opportunities to cheat on her, but I never did. I called her parents and spoke to her mother, Jenny. Hi, Joe, she said. Did you find out anything about Marcy? Yeah, I said. She lives in San Francisco with some asshole named John. John? asked Jenny. John Calloway? Yeah, I said. Did you know that? No, I didn't know, Joe, she said. Marcy and John dated in high school, but I thought she broke it off when you two started dating. No, I said. It seems like she and John have been cheating on me behind my back throughout our marriage. They've been planning this for a long time. Oh my God, Joe, she said. I'm so sorry, what are you going to do? I'm going to divorce her, I said. I understand, she said. Is there anything we can do? Yes, I said. You can all come and get her things. I don't need them. I just need my clothes, TV, tools, and stereo. Her car is still here, too. Okay, Jenny said. I'll talk to her brothers, and we'll come and get her stuff over the weekend. We finished talking, and I started flipping through the phone book looking for a lawyer. Hell, there were so many I didn't know where to start. I started calling and found one that couldn't take me in until Friday at the earliest. Friday, I thought. It was three days away. Of course, I hadn't planned to spend my vacation that way, but I had no choice. Then I decided I had to find her and check on her whereabouts. I looked through the letters John had sent her and found his address in San Francisco. Time to hit the road, I decided. Checked my truck, grabbed a few things, and hit the road. I stopped by the bank and closed our accounts, taking everything in cash. Marcy had already gone to the bank and taken about half of what we had, but I still managed to withdraw a little over $3,500. And I figured that would be enough to get us through all of this if I was careful. I still had some money left over from my stay in Okinawa that I figured would get me through the hardship. The drive took me a good eight hours after battling traffic in Los Angeles and Orange counties. Upon arrival, I stopped and got a motel room, bought a small camera and a fairly detailed map of the city and surrounding area. After studying the map, I found a street and neighborhood that matched the address in John's letters. I decided to grab a bite to eat and sleep for a few hours before embarking on my exploration. I wasn't going to run into the bitch, but I wanted to take a couple pictures together to show my parents and lawyer. Early the next morning, I drove to the neighborhood where John lived and found the apartment complex where he and Marcy were staying. I parked about a hundred feet from the main gate and watched. I put on an old rusty baseball cap and sunglasses, hoping that would provide sufficient camouflage. It didn't take me long to spot the two crooks. John and Marcy came out of the gate and headed toward a red Mustang convertible. John was dressed in cropped pants and a t-shirt and Marcy was wearing a sundress. I grabbed the camera I had with me and snapped a few pictures. Judging by the way they were dressed, I decided they wouldn't last long, so I waited. When he pulled away, I noticed his license plate. 
John Marcy. I ate one of the sandwiches I had with me and waited, and waited, and waited some more. Finally, in the afternoon, they came back. John got out of the car and opened Marcy's door. He put his arm around her as she got out and kissed her. While they were kissing, he pulled up the back of her dress at the waist, and I saw that she wasn't wearing panties. As they kissed, she pressed herself against him. As they broke the kiss, she looked away for a second, pulled her dress over her head and threw it on the front seat of the car. I took pictures of all of these, thinking they would make good evidence for my divorce. She reached for the zipper on his shorts, and I thought she was going to fuck him right there. It took everything I had not to lunge at them and beat the shit out of them right there. After a few minutes, Marcy pulled John back, and I heard her tell him to take her back to the apartment. Marcy remained naked as they went through the gate and headed towards his apartment. I waited a bit to see which apartment they were going to, and noted that the apartment had no windows through which John's car could be seen. I waited a little longer and realized that I really needed to take a piss. I had a wicked idea and walked over to John's car and pissed all over Marcy's dress, being careful not to let anyone see me. I had all the proof I needed and quietly headed outside. After checking out of the motel, I drove back to Orange County. I stopped by one of those quick photo labs to develop the film, and in two hours I had the photos and negatives in my hands. I had just enough time to sleep for a few hours, so I got some rest, showered and shaved in time to meet my lawyer. Grabbing the photos, the pawn shop receipt, and the letters from John, I hit the road again. That's when I learned that no-fault divorce in California. It didn't matter that she left the marriage, sold her rings, and cheated on me the entire time we were married. Everything had to be split 50 fiftieths. The lawyer asked how much money we had in the bank, and I told him the truth. Nothing. I also told him that she had already taken half of what we had. Besides, I added, she was making more money than me, even though she was working part-time and now had a nursing certificate. I showed him one of her paychecks, which showed that her take-home pay was almost double my pre-tax income. He warned me against trying to hide anything, and I explained that I had just returned from a year-long business trip to Okinawa and was headed to the East Coast so I couldn't drop everything and run to court. He assured me that the law provided for that, and I would not have to appear in court in person. I gave him the address where Marcy and her lover lived and offered to serve her summons there. The lawyer took all the information and said the papers would be drawn up and she would be served in a few days. If all went well, he said, I would be a free man in six months. He gave me his card and asked me to call him when I had a good mailing address in North Carolina. I gave him an upfront cash payment and left. When I returned home, I stopped by the apartment management office and informed them that I intended to leave by Monday morning. I then scheduled a time to disconnect utilities and got busy packing and cleaning. When Marcy's family arrived Saturday morning, they cleaned out the apartment and drove Marcy's car back to San Diego. So what's going on? Her father asked before he left. I pulled out the pictures I'd taken and the letters from John and showed him. His face turned white. That stupid girl, he said. I'm so sorry, Joe. I thought I raised her better than that. You didn't do anything to hurt them, did you? No, I said. I wanted to kick that bastard in the balls, but I didn't. I decided she wasn't worth going to jail over. No offense. I did customize something for his car, though. He looked at me cheerfully. What do you mean? He asked. I told him I pissed and shit on his car in Marcy's dress. To that, he laughed. It just seemed like it at the time, I said. He smiled and held out his hand. Keep in touch, Joe, he said. You're always welcome in our home. Thanks, I said. The day ended and I went out for a beer and a burger, then came home and spread my stuff out on the floor as everything else was put away. Sunday, I finished cleaning up and loaded up the car. I didn't have much stuff, just clothes, a TV, a stereo I bought in Okinawa, and tools. After securing everything, I put the top on the bed of the truck. One more night on the floor, and the next day, after getting the deposit and money for the cleanup, I left. 
I still had a little time left, so I stopped by my folks in Texas for a few days and then traveled to Cherry Point, North Carolina. When I got there, I still had over $2,500 in cash plus my rent check, so I opened a new account at the credit union and moved into a barracks. A couple months or so later, I got word from my lawyer that the divorce was final. Apparently, Marcy had decided not to contest anything and hadn't even asked for alimony. That night, I was celebrating at one of the bars in town, which is where I met Wendy. She was drinking alone, and I offered to buy her something, and she agreed. We got to talking, and it turned out that she had just dumped her boyfriend, who she had caught with another girl. We were both a little skittish and took things slow, but after a few months of getting to know each other, we fell in love with each other. We made insanely passionate love. When we were done, she propped herself up on her elbow and looked into my eyes. You know, I'm a strict one-to-one -one guy, she said, and I won't tolerate cheating. I'm strictly a one-woman man, I told her, and I just divorced a woman who cheated on me. She smiled and wrapped her arms around me. Good, she said, and kissed me deeply. That night, I proposed to her, and she accepted. A few months later, we were married in the chapel on base, and the rest is history. So, Joe, I asked, did you ever see your ex-wife after that? He looked at me and took a sip of his beer. Actually, yeah, he said. Her father retired from the Corps after about ten years and was opening a gun store. He invited Wendy and me to come and celebrate with him and his family, which we did. I was stationed at Camp Pendleton, so it wasn't too far of a drive. We had three kids by then, so we all got in the SUV and drove. He took another sip of beer. She was the only one there. Turns out she caught John cheating with another woman, he said. She looked awful. I guess she'd gained about a hundred pounds since I last saw her. She saw us together and almost burst into tears. I introduced her to Wendy and the kids, and I thought she was going to cry. Then I leaned over to her and asked, did John ever clean all that crap out of his car? He smiled and took a sip of his beer. I thought she was going to freak out, he said. Did you do that? She asked. I told her I won't say anything and walked away. Did she ever apologize to you or explain why she did it? I asked. He shook his head. No, he said. She never apologized and I didn't want to hear her rambling excuses. Besides, what's done is done, and nothing she says will change that. He handed me a picture of him and Wendy with the kids. But there is one good thing to come out of all this, he said. What's that? I asked. If Marcy hadn't cheated on me, I never would have met Wendy, and those three beautiful children would never have been born, he said. Sounds like four good things to me, I said. He thought for a moment, smiled, and touched my beer bottle with his. Four good things it is, he said, and let's not forget the six beautiful grandchildren, and let's not forget the six beautiful grandchildren.